Constantine, a Hellblazer podcast. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. Today we are doing uh, a special thing again. This is a kind of a bringing back something we tried out a couple weeks ago uh, when the first story arc or the first couple story arcs of the Jamie Delano run ended. So we're doing Hell Talk today with me and Hoku is returning. Say hi, Hoku. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the, I guess it's the third arc. It's the Family Man arc, and then it's the issues in between that we're, like, breaking that one up. Uh, and we're just going to go into that. So, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be cool because this is such a different arc than the Fear Machine and even Original Sins. Uh, I mean, it just compared to the other ones, it gets so it's so quick. Like it gets to the point. It's my favorite so far, honestly. Oh, really? Okay. Cool. Yeah, I always <laughs> yeah. liked this one a lot too. And not only that, but I mean, you're a Sandman fan, so it ties into Sandman loosely, which oh, is cool yeah. too. So <laughs> when we got to those points, I was like, yeah, even though it was just tiny, tiny little nugget. Yeah. I was still so happy. I was like, oh, you know about that. That makes me happy. I feel like an insider. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I was like, oh, she's going to love, you know, the little tie ins with the uh, serial killer uh, convention and all that. And, you know, I knew you were going to like it. So <laughs> I, I want you totally called it. I absolutely did. Yes. So uh, this and this arc, or this set of stories uh, or set of issues is uh, issue 23 through issue 31 uh, that we're going to cover here. And that is the family man story arc and the little, uh, I guess, interlude issues that kind of, gave a break to Jamie Delano with his writing. I didn't even know why they did it. Uh, I saw no weird. information. Yeah, it was weird. I don't have any information on why they did it. Like if he was behind, um, mm. but it goes like family man part one, and then it takes a break for three issues and then family man part two. So <laughs> if it was planned, it, it was something completely unconventional because who starts a new arc and then goes, Hey, we're going to like diverge without telling like you anything. You just all of a sudden are, forget about that. Hey, here's this other weird thing we're going to do. And then you swing back and you're like, oh man, I was totally doing that because I didn't want to deal with this stuff. You're like, Wait, <laughs> okay, cool. Are we back on track now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's like, you could do that easily though. Like if they wanted it put in, like if he's like, oh shit, I'm behind or something came up and we, we need three issues quick. Then they just put these filler issues in and then you just go, wow, that was crazy that I did those things. Huh? Well, back to what I'm doing, you know, like, <laughs> so. It's like in Dragon Ball Z when it's like in between the bosses and they have Goku learning how to drive with Piccolo or some stuff like that, you know, just random Gohan hanging out with a robot or, or some shit while he's training. <laughs> you have those little side things because it's not quite caught up or they're like, hey, our animators are, you know, they're still working on the main story, but we're not quite there yet. Can you guys just throw in some random story or, or the writer hasn't finished it yet? So <laughs> they need to just put a little padding a little buffer in there and you're like all right here's some random shit to do but at least they tied it back in at the end so it, it was it made it seem like it was on purpose which is probably the best way to do it where you're not just foregoing and like hey we never talk about that again or or like it didn't happen it was all in his mind or something like that so <laughs> the fact that they did keep it in continuity i appreciated even though it was weird yeah usually the way this goes is you know, there's a fill-in issue, and it has nothing to do with anything other than at some point in the character's history, this happened, and it's just like a little side story. But this, the way that they did it, it like it was just cool that they fit it in. Um, and then also, like they got two A-list writers, right? You had Grant Morrison, who at the time was writing like Doom Patrol, and he, you know, he was doing all his stuff. I think he'd written Arkham Asylum for Batman already too. And then you have, you know, Neil Gaiman, who's fresh off of Sandman, um, or he's still in the middle of Sandman, I should say. He's like probably on issue 20 or 30 by this time. So that's going and people are liking it and it's winning all the awards and everything. So, um, so yeah, it was kind of interesting to, that they did that, uh, but they got two people that are 
great writers to fill in. So normally you don't have that. Normally it's like some guy we've never heard of is writing an issue to fill in. Uh, we're trying it out, <laughs> you know? So uh, yeah, <laughs> it was nice that they had strong, strong writers, at least for that. Two busy guys filling in for another busy guy. That's kind of funny how that worked out. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, maybe they had a story they wanted to tell, you know? Um, <laughs> and I, I think, I mean, honestly, especially the Neil Gaiman one, I was like, this is solid. I mean, that's one of the best issues uh, of, of Hellblazer, in my opinion. But, um, but one thing about this arc that's interesting is there's like a zero issue of the family man, <laughs> which is issue 23. It's, it's a, it's an issue that's tied into the family man arc and you kind of need it to know what's going on in family man and why, but at the same time you don't like it's its own full story about John meeting his friend uh, and like hanging out in his house. And it turns out his friend is like some kind of literary character, like Ahab from Moby Dick or something. And you know, they have to run away from the fairy tale police basically. And yeah, like he's the basis for a bunch of different characters. So he's, he's still in continuity and that's why he wasn't allowed to leave yet. That's why he like broke their laws of like, Hey, you're still, you're not in the public domain. Wasn't yeah. it? You're not public yeah. domain. Which yeah. I love that. I thought that was amazing. I was like, Oh my gosh, that is such a cool idea. Very fables. Yeah. I was wondering, I was wondering what you thought about. Yeah. It's like fables or, um, like even some Sandman issues are like that too, where like the Shakespeare one or, you know, that kind of stuff, they, they, it's very literary and it has, has to deal with all these literary characters. Or just the idea that characters exist beyond our world and the world we've technically created. Like, that, that just because we've created them doesn't mean they're not real. They are actually real. And I like the idea of them being able to cross over into our world, affect our world, even though, you know, we created them. It, it's a really just kind of a crazy mindfuck sort of an idea. I love that. Yeah. And I think you know it it's an interesting like change of pace from what was the fear machine because the fear machine is so big and epic and serious and magical and mystical and like you have to like here's here's some hard magic like like do you understand and so many players so many players yeah a lot of players everything's going on and then this is like all right a little one-off issue that leads directly into the family man killer storyline and you wouldn't know it though if you just read the issue you're like huh that's interesting and weird and cool but then it turns out that at the end of that issue you know it leads right into the first part of the family man which is because john's living in his friend's house who is gone now because he got arrested by the fairy tale police so <laughs> if you just pick that up you're like wait why what is this house and why is it like torn apart and like full of books and weird shit um so you kind of need the context of who his friend was in order to understand why the family man comes there in order to get um, the uh, the information on the family that he kills the first, you know, the first family that he kills in the first issue of that. So it's like, yeah, you kind of need it, even though it doesn't. I don't even know if it's in the family man story arc, like in that collection. Oh, like if it, it were a trade, huh? Yeah, if it's a trade, I would put it in there because why not? Right. But um, I'm not sure if they did. Yeah, because it does start the, the next arc because it has nothing to do with the previous one so yeah and also let's talk about that for a second too so you know the end of the end of 20 or the end of the fear machine story arc which is issue 22 that like just ends with constantine being found at at sea just floating in the water by some fishermen or whatever then like they just cut to anyway enough of that issue 23 we don't even mention any of that shit other than, wow, that was weird. I'm going to go to my other friend. Like, <laughs> so, so it's kind of fun how it like just drops that in case, you know, I guess people, you don't need to spend that much time on it. Right. Cause we spent nine issues in the fear machine stuff. Right? If you don't know about it, just go back and read it. He's not going to rehash it for you, <laughs> which I was grateful for. Cause the last thing I need is like, you know, a few pages devoted to man. I can't believe that. And first this happened and then this whole thing. and like literally like rehashing it, remembering with panels and everything, you know, flashback sort of stuff. Like, I'm so glad they just didn't bother with any of that. Cause I really didn't want to go through it again. That's one nice thing about Hellblazer is unlike other characters like Swamp Thing, which is more classic style, like because he's so new and different and they don't do any of that shit where it's like last time on, you know, they don't, they don't catch you up on anything. It's just like, well, here's an issue. And most of the time, the issues are strong enough on their own that you'll like read it and be like, I don't know what's going on, but I like this. 
and I need to go back and get the other issues. Like that's how it works with Hellblazer. With there's me. less hell. Oh, what do you call hand holding? I think is the word I'm thinking. Yes, of. yes, and yeah, like I think the first stuff I ever read of Hellblazer was like from issue 140, and I just picked like a trade of a writer that I liked, and I was like, I don't even know. The only thing I know is the movie and this, you know. So it's like. Uh, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try to read this. And it, I mean, it, it fit like, obviously there's continuity that builds, but the way that Jamie Delano writes, I mean, you don't have to know the other story arcs in order to jump in to these, these other issues, which I like a lot, you know, uh, especially because fear machine is, I think we both said last time is our least favorite. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's yeah. So far it is definitely the bottom of the three. <laughs> Yeah, and it's not, I mean, like I said, there's some cool ideas in it. For sure. Uh, but but it definitely lasted a lot. It was a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this one is the opposite of that. And I wonder if he got feedback about it. I wonder if he got feedback from his editors or maybe other friends or something where it's like. Can you can you, can you you tone it down a little? Can you cons- make it a little more concise? Give us a, a short shorter arc if possible. You know, keep it under six, maybe. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Let's do a four. Let's do a tight four. How about that? You know, like, that's what and it, and it works. I mean, like this story flows, especially if you just read the four issues of the Family Man story, that just flows really fast. But um, you know, you throw in the Grant Morrison and Neil Gaiman issues in the middle of it, and it you know it does pad it out, but not in a bad way. Like because you're like, oh, I want to get back to this family man even though these are really good um so yeah the so the family man first issue which is issue 24 that one is um you know it's the setup right so as that happens like what do you think when like it's, it's introducing this old man and it doesn't quite you don't quite know who he is yet and he just goes to the door and then like the reveal that John's friend, his you know his really good friend that sells his wares and stuff, was dealing in serial killer goods. That's a pretty fucked up like, that's like snuff film dealing or something. You know, it's pretty messed up. I like how they sort of ease you into it with him going around his house and like, oh money, oh oh drugs, okay, all right, money, drugs, weird weird stuff around here. And then by the end of it, and then of course reading through the journal and him being like. Oh yeah, so I got this guy, this, this stuff from this guy, and oh no, he wants something newer. And John's like, "The fuck am I reading?" <laughs> you know, it takes him a minute to be like, "Oh no, wait, he's real. Oh, he really is doing this. Holy shit!" <laughs> like, well, my opinion of him just dropped. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, he's been with his friend, for, or he's known his friend for a long time, and never knew that he was dealing in like serial killer wares. And not only that, but he's giving like victims to the serial killer in order to have, to get like fresh crime scenes to get um, the uh, ev- evidence to sell. So we could be like memorabilia. I don't know which is worse. The like the getting the memorabilia or the giving of like, I think, I mean, the whole thing is messed up 100%, but it, it's like, if you had to pick which part of it was the worst, I, it's probably the giving out of fresh victims in exchange for for the pieces like i mean there's one thing about like if he's just like hey i found this serial killer guy and i got him to like trade me fresh pieces like that's totally messed up but it's like the deed is done and you're and you're getting a piece of it afterwards i'm not condoning it in any way but i'm like hey, that that's that's a level of horrible but the level of horrible above that is the like i traded him a new group of people in exchange for that you're like oh man that is yeah that is worse <laughs> That is way worse. And I mean, obviously the family man's probably going to kill regardless, but the fact that that specific family is dead because of you, you know, maybe he wouldn't have found that family. It would have been someone else, or maybe he would have got caught or something, you know, who knows? Uh, But now that you're like giving him names, now you're responsible for those specific deaths, which is really creepy to me. And then also that kind of lets you know, you know, we haven't met too many of John's friends other than the ones that are dead, you know, like the ghosts that follow him around. So this is another friend and, he, you know, he doesn't really have a lot of good friends. I'd say Chaz is probably his Best his friend. most normal friend, right? Yeah. <laughs> and friend is, I mean, they're friends, but. Best acquaintance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Best guy he shits on sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Best Uber driver. That's what, that's what Chaz is. Um, 
But yeah, like this is just another kind of oh, John hangs out with a lot of terrible people. Yeah. Or knows a lot of terrible people at least. So And he doesn't necessarily know that the people he knows are terrible. Like to an extent he's like, Yeah, he's probably not like the, the he's probably shady. But then to learn more about it to the point where he's just like, Oh, I really made a bad call befriending this guy, didn't I? <laughs> he's actually worse than me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, maybe I didn't know him as good as I thought. Yeah, I'm pr- I'm pr- I'm actually happy he went to fairy tale jail. Yeah, it was probably a good idea that that he got caught and taken away. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then at the end of that one, you know, he didn't know that the family man was this old nice guy that, or the pretending old nice guy that, uh, you know, came to his house. So he ended up giving him the new names on accident. He was like, "Oh, do you need this envelope? Here you go." And I was like, "Shit!" So, but then the funny thing is. We get that we get that cliffhanger, and then it's like, and the next issue, Grant Morrison is writing, is writing, and you're like, what? What the fuck happened? Why are we in this? Like you left town? me on like, okay, so we just found out this old dude kills people. Has probably been doing it for a very long time. John's like, like, what am I? What am I gonna do? I gotta do something. And then I'm gonna go on vacation, visit my sister, sister, yeah, cousin, or friend. No, it's just friend. friend. It's just a friend. <laughs> yeah, she invited him. Uh, through a letter or whatever, so it was just like a friend. And you're like, wait, did are we going backwards in time? Is this just like a a totally unrelated moment happening? Like he did this two months ago. Is this the future? Like everything has actually happened, and maybe he's going to talk about what happened. It's a pretty jarring jump to like give absolutely no context to why this is suddenly happening when you just set up of him having almost an existential crisis of I'm going I just became responsible for killing this family what am I going to do about it and then vacation <laughs> yeah well the interesting thing is I, I get the idea because they the, they didn't have to even tie it in because these stories could have been they could have just cut to them and then you'd be like oh this is a filler issue and then the same with the second part of it and then the Neil Gaiman one could also have just been a filler issue and then they could have just been like, and eh, we're back at regular, you know, Hellblazer time and place or whatever. So they didn't have to, but they, they went through the effort of <laughs> going like, man, that was really messed up with the family, man. So I got to take a break to get out of town and clear my mind. So like they, they make it a point to say that. So that, that's very interesting. And then this is also the first time I think that we know or that we get that Hellblazer is actually in real time. Like meaning there's three months that go by in those three issues and that's how long he was out of London, you know, in between issue 24 and 27. So, or 28. Um, and so that's like very, very unusual is that like normally comic books, you know, Batman started in the forties or 39 or whatever. And he still looks the same as he, like he's still the same age. So yeah. <laughs> like, like people don't normally age with the comic Every time they reboot him, he gets younger too. So <laughs> yes, exactly. Or they get you know whatever. Uh, yeah, now it's in Smallville and he's a kid or whatever. So yeah. Uh, but that but the, John is a very interesting character because he has three hundred issues where he ages in real time. So maybe not every issue is a month, but each story arc definitely has time pass in his real life. So uh, I know later on, like we we definitely had him celebrate like a thirty. 38th birthday or something somewhere in here and then not in this story arc but sometime uh in in jamie delano's run and then in uh in garth ennis's run later i know there's an issue that's called 40 because john turns 40 in it so it's actually like in real time um and that's why at the end of like issue 300 or by the end of issue 300 he was like in his 60s and you know getting old he's still you know scrappy or whatever but yeah they they never quite drew him old like that, like old man or anything, but he definitely had more like wear on him as a character uh, by then. So I thought that was cool. I always liked that when I found that out. Um, and this was like the first time I ever heard that mentioned. If you compared, I'm assuming like his later, late 200 y sort of episode or uh, issues to beginning, there would be a difference in that he actually looks aged, I'm assuming. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, and it's like a very interesting. Um, it's just, like I said, it's just no one's ever do- does that with regular uh, like characters. Superman, Batman, they're all you know too super to stay around 
and like age <laughs> i guess they their stories are infinite yeah or it's like a special sort of like else worlds uh a, a whole separate thing not part of the main timeline or something a kingdom come where yeah superman and batman and everybody is aged up because they went forward like 20 ish years or something like 20 30 years exactly yeah and even swamp thing i mean there's six volumes of that and every everyone kind of reboots him in a certain way you know so like uh, but John, you know, there's 300 straight issues. And then when they re- did reboot him in 2013, he was young again. So they like brought him back to like his 20s or something like that, or like oh. 30. Yeah. So they did that on purpose. Like we need a young Hellblazer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, and you know, we'll eventually get there because even though, so I did read those when they came out because, uh, but it was right when I stopped buying comics because of money problems so i was like okay well i'm too poor to buy comics so you know i can't you know i did my 300 issue run i got that at least and then uh i just ended up like starting to read those digitally and then was like "Eh, i don't know about this new constantine (laughs) so but in in you know in completion for completion's sake i will after reading the 300 issues of the normal run i will definitely dig into those other two runs after uh, the new 52 so cool. uh yeah it's but that's you know <laughs> years away now <laughs> we we've got time to get there yeah we got time a lot of time but uh <laughs> back to the 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 family man so um since we since he does go on vacation uh what did you think about this grant morrison comic or the storyline specifically like well first off how familiar are you with grant morrison as a writer I always knew his name. I'm horrible with names, but I knew his name. I just like, you could probably tell me what he's written. I'd be like, oh, okay. Yeah, I know that. But if you ask me what he's written off the top of my head, I I have no clue. (laughs) Okay. Well, I'll tell you a couple. He did um, All-Star Superman with Frank Quietly. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. So he works with Frank Quietly a lot. And I know you don't, you're not a fan of Frank Quietly's art. I'm not a super fan of his artwork. No. (laughs) I love We Three, but that's just because it's you know ninety percent animals. So <laughs> yeah, so he wrote We Three as well. Um, so yeah, he was the writer on that. I do like his writing. I really do. He is an amazing writer. Yeah, he's got some. Uh, for me, he's very. Uh, when he hits, he's very good. And when he misses, I'm like, what is this? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's very weird, like how I can like his. Uh, but he's good enough that I will always try his stuff out. But sometimes it does not hit with me at all, and I'm like, what the fuck is this? So. Um, yeah, there's a, there's been a couple series where I'm like I don't under, I don't understand how this is the same guy that I normally like, but that's you know n- neither here nor there. <laughs> but personal this taste, is, this, I totally get that. exactly <laughs> personal taste. Um, but this little story arc of two issues, um, I enjoyed. I thought it was fun. It it did remind me a little bit of Fear Machine. I don't know if you got the same feeling. I think it was. I suppose, yeah, the the controlling aspect of it, controlling people subconsciously without them realizing, although it was more of them like being, it reminded me a bit of the Sandman issue where they're in the diner and you're just kind of releasing people's inner horribleness, essentially, like they're taking away their, their, their mental controls of like, oh, I shouldn't do that. And just letting them be like, yes, do whatever it is that you're feeling like you wanted to do. You've always wanted to do this. Just go and do it. And, and yeah, so that idea, that story of just allowing people to just be their is, I guess you could say, and and embrace whatever their darkness or, you know, the, the extreme wants that turn out to be darkness inside them is totally messed up. Like, I loved this story because of how horrible it was. Yeah, there's some really messed up stuff. Oh, it was so awful. And yeah, that, that first issue, I was like, uh, <laughs> if you like animals or babies, yeah. <laughs> don't listen to this, maybe. It's probably a good idea you did that disclaimer because <laughs> that one definitely needed it. <laughs> yeah, I don't always do that. It, it's kind of hard because with Hellblazer, anything could be triggering. There's a lot of messed up stuff in it. So, yeah. you know, if I did that for everyone, it would just be. Like everybody you just have just a list of everything most... you'd have to <laughs> go <laughs> yes, through every exactly. time. Yes, exactly. It's every time. <laughs> if you've hung in this long, you should know that horrible things are going to happen. But just in case you don't know the specific level of horrible, here's a little, just, just a quick warning that this, this particular issue is a bit horrible. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think it's because it dealt with like animals and like, yeah. 
and babies. Yeah. <laughs> Specifically. Those are pretty hardcore. A specific level of messed up that some people just may not want to see visually. See, and the worst part is, of course, we can't see it. So you then have to describe it for us. I describe it for you and you have to picture it in your head. <laughs> <laughs> I make you see it. Yeah. <laughs> it's even worse. <laughs> Yeah, that, yeah, that is a different level of horrible. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that's why I was like, okay, you know, we're going to get into some of these topics. And the interesting mm -hmm. thing is the first one is cra is crazy violent like that. Yes. And there's a lot of messed up stuff. And then the second one, it's just like, oh, yeah, they, you know, they like fly a plane and r drive a car, listen to some music. Like there wasn't anything that was like super horrible. It was a good choice to go like way up extreme and then peter down and sort of like, all right, they did these mm -hmm. horrible things and now they all died. <laughs> yes yeah yeah and also that town is gone probably so we don't have we don't even have to think about it yeah <laughs> <laughs> so that was a good way to do it like introduce it with like absolutely horrible like you know up to 10 horrible things are happening and you're like oh is it gonna get worse than this and it's like no 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 it's okay it's okay we're gonna go down a little bit because because they've done the horrible things now and 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 now they're, they're dead it's, it's it's, yes. all, it's done. <laughs> it's fine. They're all dead. And then also <laughs> another one of John's friends who gets left out of the friends who died. You know, she dies. I don't. Judith yeah. Or no, I, I can't remember what her name is. But I forgot um, it too. <laughs> yeah, she dies. So Claire, yeah, Claire. I don't know. What's up? <laughs> uh, but so much so that like I don't remember what it is, and I can remember all his other friends because they mentioned mm -hmm. them so often. So she was definitely. This was not considered like in continuity necessarily with the friends that he actually cares about mm -hmm. that come to haunt him, even though. She died during this. I guess not because of him. So maybe that's why too. Because... Yeah, it wasn't necessarily his like a direct result of of him doing something that caused this. He was just happened to be there. Not like Richie or yeah or, or <laughs> the other people. He didn't make a conscious choice to be like, um, so I'm gonna pull this plug and then everyone's gonna go crazy, you know, sort of thing. Like he didn't necessarily have a hand in it. He was just one of those wrong place, wrong time. Sort of guys <laughs> exactly yeah um yeah I, I did notice i didn't think it was too familiar to the fear machine story arc but i did get hints of it while i was reading it and i was mm -hmm. like wow we've only had two issues between the fear machine and this <laughs> and i could definitely see like oh this is like a mini fear machine story arc like like this probably would have been better if it was a little bit further away from fear machine but yeah it it was still separated enough and it was short enough that it was like oh, okay that's fine but I definitely noticed there was a similar similarity in it. Just a, just a smidge, just a little sprinkling of it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just like the mass control of people. Yeah, and like releasing a fear or a you know a, a want or something inside mm -hmm. of them. It was just similar in that way. Um, and then, so at the end of that issue, then you think, oh, okay, now we're gonna go back to London because he gets in a car and he's like going to London. Nope. But then he, he doesn't, well, you know, he does go to London, but he doesn't go straight back to his friend's house. Yeah. And like deal with what he did. So he goes and uh, just starts hanging out. I think he's at like a party or something. And this is the Neil Gaiman issue. And I know you love Neil Gaiman because you love Sandman. Yeah. So as a Neil Gaiman fan, how, how high do you rate this issue? Like writing wise, did you think like the story and everything? Did you, did you like it a lot? I really did like this one. I I have a hard time ranking stuff because for me, just about everything Neil Gaiman does is like a 10. So if you tell me, like, is it a like a 10.5 compared to everything else? It's like 10.1 to 10.9. I, I think it's, it's definitely up there with everything else. I, I did enjoy it. <laughs> well, the, I know that this issue, issue 27, is like a very rare issue. Hmm. I don't know why. I don't know. Maybe because the f the Family Man story arc paused. Maybe people dropped off or something after the, the Morrison uh, storyline because they did like a very big underprinting of this issue. I don't ah. know why because Sandman is going hard right now, you know, at this time. So you would think that you put Neil Gaiman on it, it would you would think it would sell, right? But yeah. Um, but they did a big underprinting of it. And so it's pretty hard to find. And when you do find it, it's always like over $25. Um, I got it like 20 years ago for five bucks. So I was like, oh, and that man. was like, oh, I don't know, five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, uh, it, I mean, the, uh, 
the cover on this one I like a lot because you get Dave McKean artwork. And mm -hmm. I think this is the first time we've seen him do the covers for this. Um, I'm trying to remember. I can't remember who did the early covers, but I'm pretty sure this is the first time we see Dave McKean do any covers for Hellblazer. Um, nice. But yeah, his art is super interesting. It's all like multimedia and stuff. So yeah, he'll do a painting and then he'll put like twigs on top of the painting and then blow smoke and then take a picture of everything all at once. And then that is what the cover looks like. But that's interesting because I don't know. I, I thought he painted all that when like it wasn't real media. Like I didn't realize there was actual sticks on top of the paintings or like, you know, I, I didn't know how he did it. Yeah, I didn't realize that that it was that involved. I knew it was sort of like a mishmash of like some things were painted and some things were like fabric and some things were, uh, you know, like just weird knickknacky things that he would put there. But I didn't realize it was it was even more pulled back up to like adding even more outside elements. I thought it was, say, like a static image that had like weird stuff on top of it. And, and so it would be like a picture of that. But now you're telling me it's even more pulled back of like throwing in other elements of like you say smoke or probably light or or uh, just like even more of an expansion than it is just a painting was like wow that's really cool i didn't know that part <laughs> well even a painting it's like wow but then like you add all that stuff like i one of the covers he did i think for sandman mm -hmm. i saw how he did it i think it might even be sandman number one where there's like uh there's like text and stuff on the sides yeah and he all the text is like well the the actual cover itself if you bought it uh like the original art for it is actually like in a shadow box because Ooh. there's so much stuff and it's so 3d that the painting is underneath and there's all these 3d pieces above it and so like if you were going to buy it it would be like a shadow box that is three feet by five feet oh wow <laughs> and it's just full of you know it's full of stuff you know like that full of so cool. things he glued down i guess over the painting um yeah, it's very interesting. I'd never, I didn't know that they did that. I just thought, mm. I don't know, because it's computer age that I'm thinking of. Like, oh yeah, they just took like a picture of a stick and then put it into the computer and then like Photoshop it on or top. Something. Yeah, like Photoshop it. But you know, you still do the the photographing yeah. of the objects or whatever, but yeah. you add them yourself. But this was like, no, nah, he just does it all by hand and then takes a picture of the final product and then that's the cover. They just have to print it in that size. That is so cool. It's very interesting. I knew like half that process. I didn't realize it was even more. Well, that is, that's amazing. Yeah. But uh, that's just one cool part of this story. Like the, he does the inside art too, which is kind of unusual for Dave McKean. He doesn't always do interiors. Oh, I didn't realize he did the inside art too. I thought he just did the cover. Yeah. He did the inside art. Oh, cool. It's very interesting inside art as well. It's a little bit more scratchy, but it works for the story, which is about ghosts and stuff. Um, and this one is so like sad and spooky it's you know the the whole idea of like ghosts of homeless people that just want someone to hold them and people are repulsed because they smell like dead homeless people and they so they try to pull away and they end up killing getting killed as the because they don't go for the hug they pull away they get frozen or whatever by the touch of the homeless man it's like the fuck like <laughs> super sad it's a little bit christmas carol sort of like it like the idea of like the ghost haunting and and just i mean obviously not in the same way but just that idea of it being sort of an intimate story between like people and the ghost that just happens to be there it's like a very small tight story which i think is another thing that makes it so creepy it's not huge in that it's like you know a, a, an army of ghosts attacking the city sort of thing it's like just this one ghost and all he wants is a hug. <laughs> yeah, just give him a hug. It's so sad. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and one other interesting part of this story arc, and I don't know if you caught it, but or this issue is, um, so part of it deals with John going to like a party and meeting a girl, and he thinks he's going to have sex with this girl. And then he realizes, wait a second, you're like, aren't you a lesbian? Like, are you a lesbian friend? Like, why are you trying to have sex with me? And it turns out this girl's trying to get John's uh sperm so that she can have a baby he's trying to she's trying to get him to impregnate her and that was like wait a second how many people are trying to get john to impregnate them because we got swamp thing we got this lesbian lady it's like <laughs> how many people yeah that was a that was a pretty funny callback <laughs> yeah i guess that happened before this like just before this so 
it was a callback to that probably because Neil Gaiman, I'm sure, read that Rick Veach stuff where they were ta- where he took – yeah, because that happened in issue nine of Swamp Thing, right? So – I mean of uh, Hellblazer. So um, – Because it was after the Demon Blood, which was – Yes. Yeah. That was issue nine. So – Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's – like Neil Gaiman's calling back to that, which I thought was funny. I'm like, how many people want to take John's seed? Like, <laughs> and why do people think he's a good father? I would not want him as my <laughs> right or donor in general. You know, just like a good donor is like, oh, I'm sorry, do you not know about his lifestyle? <laughs> yeah. Also, demon blood. Like, if he yeah. ever gets anyone pregnant, it's like you're part demon. That that can't be good for a kid, right? Those lesbians would have had a surprise when they got into their terrible twos, probably. Oh man, I could only imagine. <laughs> they definitely dodged a bullet. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, you know, we both really liked this Neil Gaiman issue. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you think of these, like this, the time away overall? Like, did you were you okay with it? Did you did it make you want the Family Man arc more? Like, were you like, ooh, I need to find out what happens, and I like these stories, but I need to get back to the Family Man. Well, it was strange because you weren't sure sort of like fear machine like how how long was this interlude gonna go how many issues is it gonna be before we actually get back to the story so it's a little bit of trepidation a little bit of like okay so this is the third you know issue now that we're okay so we had a little two-part of story we have this story it ended you know and had an ending so obviously it's not leading into another half a story it's like okay so is the next issue going to be the start of it again is there going to be another tangent so there was a little bit of you know uncertainty with this being a, a sort of like segue away from the main story but when it did come back you're like oh okay that was just it was a short little interlude that's not so bad you know the uncertainty of reading it in the moment when you're like okay where's this going why why are we jumping away from the action that we kind of just had this huge revelation but then when it does come back you're like oh okay so that, that wasn't so bad knowing after the fact that you do come back after just three issues. But but during the moment, it's like, these are great stories, but you have in the back of your mind, yes, like I kind of want to get back to the main story. How long is that going to take? How long is that story also going to take? You know, just the interlude and then how long is the arc going to be? Because given what we came from, you're like, oh man, <laughs> like taking a break and then also we have another seven issues to get through. So Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because if the family man came back and it was like, you know, and now back to the 12-part story, you're like... Yeah, exactly. Like, (laughs) Like, why did we have the interlude, too? Now this is even longer. (laughs) Yes. Uh, But, yeah, the nice thing is it comes back and it throws you right back into it with him being like, okay, I got to face my problems now. Like, I can't keep running like I was the last three issues. So, like, we're jumped right back into it. And then John is on, you know, the hunt and everything, and... Um, I liked the back and forth of this because we spent some time with the family man himself and both, well, the, at first John thinks he's got ahead of the family man, like he's on top of it, but the family man is actually like way ahead of him. And then once John realizes that then it switches and the family man is actually behind John and John's trying to trick him. So there's a lot of back and forth of each one trying to trick the other and who's got the, the leg up on the other. And I liked that a lot, the back and forth. What do you think of that? Yeah, it was like a great game of cat and mouse where they both think they're the cat and they're both the cat and the mouse at the same time. So it was a very tricky and I thought it was well written because you could have very easily gotten confused with what was going on, who was where, who was doing what. But the way they paced it and the way they, uh, you know, separated each of their sections to where they, they weren't really interacting with each other, but they somehow managed to sort of share the same space which is, you know, city-wise, and, and closing in on each other, where they're both just like, ha-ha, I'm going to get him. He's like, ha-ha, I'm going to get him. And, oh, no, he actually got me. <laughs> yeah, one thing that's interesting about the space thing with, like, they're both in the same city, but, like, as an American, I don't know any of the parts of London or, like, where they are in reference to the others. So I'm always like, okay, now he's saying Liverpool – I'm assume, I don't know how far that is away from his original flat or the area that he goes to to sleep with that um, or to stay with that hooker that he stays with. Like, I don't know where those are in relation to each other. So I'm like, I guess they're we'll say they're 10 miles away. Each of them are 10 miles away from each other. 
<laughs> like that's how I think of it in my head. Sometimes it's a further. It's it's actually quite a ways away, and then you know eventually they do, they do get closer. But yeah, it is funny to see sort of like the naming of the distances and cities. I did I did find it so creepy the way the family man and I've already forgotten what his real name is, so that's what I'm gonna call him. But the way <laughs> <laughs> the way he's able to sort of use his influence as a, a seemingly upstanding citizen to get information that most people would just offhandedly give to someone like him, you know? Like 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 that's really creepy. Yeah, him being an old man, he's like will you help me find this address? Like, you know, mm -hmm. like, like he can do that. And then also, um, apparently he was like a PI or something before. So he could talk to the police and kind of get information from them at those local police bars. So, and that's actually something normal. Yeah. Just using his reputation to be able to get almost anything that he wants or needs and people being none the wiser, just being like, Oh, I just helped this guy. That's so nice. Sort of the way John was sort of roped into helping him. We're just like, Oh yeah, this old guy just came by for a letter and he's, he's going to, you know, give my friend a package in return. That's, that's totally normal. That doesn't seem like a horrible thing. And then you realize that you've, you know, sort of helped in the murder of somebody without even realizing it is awful, <laughs> but amazing at the same time. It's like, ah, oh, that is, that's like, a worse fear is to think that something you've done has caused harm to someone else, even if you didn't know that that's what happened. Like, that's just a horrible feeling. <laughs> you were just a pawn in this game that was started by your friend and mm -hmm. some freak that likes serial killer memorabilia. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah. And then finding out about that guy. Oh, that guy. Oh, dude. I hated that guy. I hated him worse than the family guy, a family man, almost, almost, you know, but I, I mean, he's basically the same person, just too scared to do it himself. So he has to like buy these snuff films from, you know, other people who can do it or whatever. And like he lives vicariously through them, but he really wants to do it secretly. He just can't do it. So, it's weird, but there's something about at least the family man does it on his own. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, at least the family man does it himself. And he's not necessarily doing it to like make money or anything. I, I'm not saying again. I'm not saying that I, I condone what he's doing. I'm not saying I condone what the family man did, but at least he did it himself. And he has a level of of like pride. I want to say work and, ethic. You know, <laughs> he he keeps to himself. He's not trying to like make money off of it or film or whatever. And the only reason he even did the swapping was so that he could get more victims. So it wasn't even like, I'm trying to make money off this. It's his own personal vendetta against people that he just lo loves or hates. I still never quite figured out his exact, you know, reasoning behind why he killed people. Yeah. Well, I think the big revelation at the end of this, that like the whole time I kind of was reminded of like Rorschach's uh, from the Watchmen, like, where his storyline is like he sees his mom and his mom's like a prostitute and she's having sex with someone or whatever. And that kind of messes Rorschach up. And I thought that's what this was like too. Like, oh, he saw his mom and she's a prostitute. But then at the end, you find out that now nah, his mom and his dad were, they were the ones in the bed together. So she wasn't sleeping with anybody. And he just was like, you came home late. I was scared. You promised that you wouldn't. You said like cross, what was it? Like cross my heart to die. We'll be, we'll be home before midnight or whatever like we promise and he's just like well you broke your promise so you die and it's just a black and white way he sees the world but there was also that undertone of like love that that i didn't quite grasp that it just seemed like such a um oh, what do you call it just such a weird idea in that he kills people because he he loves them or like they're the expression of love that they have for each other sickens him so much that he he kills them and then like places them lovingly with each other like with that first family that he killed like the husband i was thinking of it maybe like he kills them when they're in they're still like they're still in their loving moments so if he kills them now it preserves that love and they don't get a chance to like have the love curdle or whatever you know later on so, like, if it's a happy family. It's like with the dog, right? Because his dad, when his dad killed the dog, he said, you, you kill him with love because you don't want them to suffer. And so I'm assuming he just extrapolated from that, like, oh, if I kill them at the perfect moment of love that they're in, 
they'll never their love will never will never wither and die they'll never grow apart they'll be perfectly preserved like that forever maybe <laughs> that's what i get i'm you know it's that's close it's, i mean it, it's it is kind of uh, kind of like a lot of things that jamie delano writes in this they're like really good ideas and sometimes they don't fully like click at the end but they're so good so such good ideas that i'm like on board <laughs> like like i didn't quite understand his motivations but i got it I, like i could i could kind of feel the edges of it you know like like i'm i i understood what he was going for i'm not sure if he fully pulled it off but i like what i read you know that's kind of how i feel about a lot of his stuff um because not he's written a lot more than just hellblazer and usually i have that feeling about his writing where i'm like there were some really cool things in this and i like what he was doing but like sometimes it just doesn't click 100 percent with me so or like the it doesn't all come together at the end nicely sometimes but um but you know I mean, that's what he likes to write, apparently, because he writes a lot of stuff like that. But um, maybe that's he, maybe he likes leaving the reader with like some questioning thing in the back of their head or whatnot. I suppose it's good to have it be kind of a gray area because then people talk about it and try to figure it out themselves instead of it being a black and white sort of like he kills people just because he wants to or because he, he was <laughs> disappointed as a child, you know. Or, you know, his parents didn't keep his promise, so they killed him. And I that's what I thought originally. I thought it was because his parents didn't keep the promise of being home on time. He was like, well, you know, I'm a stickler for the rules. And so I killed you. <laughs> yeah. But then it, I mean, they do mention that. But yeah. But then it still seems to be sort of an evolution of of that. Plus, you know, I guess since since he was disappointed and he loved his parents so much, he didn't like the idea that he that they could disappoint him. So if he killed them now, they'll never disappoint him again. And he preserves their love for him and him for them forever. And then I guess that just expands into strangers for some reason. <laughs> sure. I mean, <laughs> he's a sociopath. So yeah, just moves in that way, I guess. Um, but yeah. And then and another relationship in this, this story arc is da John's dad is in it. And we don't really know that much about his dad other than him and his dad don't get along. Um, and so it's really crazy that the first time we meet John's dad is when the family man comes to visit him and murders him. So it's like, oh, shit. Yeah, that kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah. And and one thing that's kind of different probably than other comics is if you're going to introduce a an important character in your main character's life, um, like someone's dad or mother or whatever, you usually don't murder them on the first time you meet them. And then also usually the hero of the book is going to save them. So like if Ma Kent is going to die on the farm, Superman will find a way to make that not happen in those pages. But in this, nah, his dad gets killed and he's like, well, I don't, you know, sorry, dad. I'm sad now. He, in fact, he doesn't even know about it for like three issues. So, like, <laughs> so when he finds out, he's like, Oh my God, you know? And, uh, and the interesting thing, interesting thing is that he is, it's, it's very realistic the way that he reacts because he's super torn up and sad about it. But also we know that he didn't like his dad and we hear from his dad, how much they kind of had a bad relationship or a strained relationship. So, I mean, I've had people die in my life that I loved and was sad about them dying. But then at the same time, I have this weird feeling because when they were alive, we had issues, you know? So it's like, uh, I could totally relate to that that uh this that part of this story um and i don't know just, I, it's also probably because that person is his dad right it's like the only his mom died when he was a kid so john only had his dad to uh you know look up to or have as a figure of uh you know a parental figure and so um i don't know the, to me i was surprised just that they would kill off like his dad and then John doesn't even think about using magic to bring him back, which is very uncharacteristic of a superhero book, right? Where, like, sometimes with his other friends, he would be thinking, like, oh, is there any way that I can change this? Is there any way that I can, like, help or undo this? And in, and when he hears that his dad's dead, he's just like, oh. Yeah, there's no there's no thought. Well, that, that might also be because he doesn't like his dad that much, but there's no thought of, like, maybe I can, you know, get some magic scroll or some shit. There's none of that. It's just like, oh man, dad's dead and was murdered by this guy. 
it's more of like now he's feared for his life because the family man is close to him like and found out enough that he knew who his dad was so he's got to watch his back and that's kind of he doesn't even think about bringing his dad back so um and that leads me to the ending of this story arc which is so john is so freaked out that he gets a gun which yeah. he said multiple times he does not like guns and does not want to use them and i will go on record saying if you're not a fan of guns you probably shouldn't grab one just when you need it like in one moment and you've never shot one before and you're like i'm gonna kill someone with this because i could have seen this arc like if he really wanted to put that whole like guns are bad thing in this um like he could have made it so the gun don't work you know like like the gun doesn't work when it's supposed to or he might have accidentally shot somebody else or yeah something like that yeah or just messed it up somehow <laughs> yeah i thought maybe that was going to happen because john is shoot himself on so. accident <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that, yeah i could totally see that happening but i was surprised that it actually worked like it was supposed to and went off and you know was able to kill the family man but then what did you think about the whole con the idea that he put forth of even though this man is a serial killer john did not want to kill him at the end right like he was forced to kill him uh in the middle of the fight but like he went into the battle being like i'm gonna kill him and then as it got there he's like i can't do it and and like I don't know. For me, I'm like, hey, he's a serial killer. <laughs> like, go for it. But I, the idea that, like, even any life is worth something, you know, like, shouldn't be murdered, even the life of a serial killer who's active. You know, maybe it would be one thing if the serial killer who isn't active and Had he's eight years old and now. And, yeah. <laughs> and we found out 20 years after his last murder that he was the murderer. Okay. Like, you know, I... I get I, being sympathetic a little bit or whatever. Killing him now wouldn't undo yeah. what he's done. Like, what would you really kill him now? Sort of, sort of idea. Yeah, yeah, but like, if he was in his prime, you know, like, yeah, let's stop this fucker. Like, I don't know what the argument is there, but he felt it. <laughs> he felt bad about it, I guess. So, but that's weird, also, because sometimes, like, sometimes the characterization doesn't fully fit other things we've seen. Like, yeah, like he really had no qualms about people dying, or, or like he literally killed his friends. He's killed two friends in this book, and Zed was Zed. He like, he's like, I'm gonna sleep with you and ruin. Like, you might be killed by this angel. I don't know, but we need to stop this whole, you know, God angel thing happening with the new Mary. So. Sorry, I had sex with you. It, it seemed like he had some qualms about hurting and or killing his friends. Like, he's like, oh, man, like, this kind of sucks, but I'm going to do it anyway. You know, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to see this through to the end. And his hesitation to kill, one, a guy who murdered his dad, and two, has murdered probably hundreds of people, and, and three, will go on to murder more people that, he, and, and four, is not his friend, is a stranger, essentially, that he just happened to bump into and is now in a position to end his, you know, quiet but, but real reign of terror. It is a little weird that he hesitates as much as he does. The only thing I could think is after the Fear Machine story arc, he is a changed man. That, you know, like, there, there is personal growth that the character does go through that they reference later on. And so, like, maybe that was John before. Like, he, in the first couple issues of Hellblazer, he's, you know, his friend Gary Lester, he sacrifices him to Namath, the god or whatever. And you know, it sucked, demon. but he was still like, I'm going to do this. Like, we got to yeah. this through. But maybe he's sick of that so much now, and he's ha he's gone through so much, like, after the Fear Machine story arc that he's like okay i i don't think i can deal with this anymore they don't say that specifically but i could see that being what he's what he's thinking as right as he's writing this arc maybe there's a difference between an immediate thing that he knows if he stops this he saves the city versus you know this guy could trip and fall and break his neck because he's old like tomorrow or maybe he'll just stop killing and retire like you said you know maybe he'll be like ah after he kills me he'll he'll be done and, you know, therefore I can sacrifice myself as his last victim. And then, you know, everything's over with. But the idea that he could kill this guy not knowing the future consequences of, like, has he really saved anybody or did he just take a life on purpose for revenge, essentially? And so that, that could be another layer of his hesitation of, you know, it's not, it's not him saving the world necessarily. It's him killing a man with the hopes 
that it does, you know, do better. But still, he has to make the physical act of killing him because he did kind of get like Papa Midnight to help with Gary Lester. He did kind of get the other friends, other friends to help him with the fear machine where he, I mean, all he did was have sex, really. So, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like that, I don't think was as as hard of a choice in that storyline of like how to help necessarily or how to his, to play his part. But in this one, it was like, no, you have to make a direct choice. Because if he tries to tell anybody, who's going to believe him? If he tries to, you know, somehow like breadcrumbs, like, oh, like lead people, like, you know, some, I don't know, videotape him murdering somebody and then be like, ah, I got you on camera and then like get him put away in jail. It's like, no, he's got to make the decision to stop this guy. It is a little weird that he decides to go with a gun instead of, I don't know, magic or <laughs> right, maybe yeah. something a little less. He could have, he could have called, like he could have opened a doorway to hell and pushed him in or something. You know what I mean? You know, like, he could have been like, Hey demon, I got a soul for you or something like, Oh, uh, you know, that broker soul guy that is always like, I'll get you John Constantine. He'd be like, Hey, by the way, here's, here's a peace offering or something. But the fact that his, First thought is gun is a little weird, <laughs> especially for someone who's never used a gun. Like that would be like, I, I wouldn't automatically go, I should get a gun when I have fired a gun once on a range and, and, you know, years ago. And if you were to tell me like, now, Hey, get a gun and kill someone. I'd be like, um, well, well first off, no, I'm not going to kill somebody, but like, I don't know how to use a gun. So <laughs> it, it's just a weird thought to be like his first, you know, instinct or whatever you want to call it is like yeah i should get a gun and like not figure out how to use it but just have it in case well the funny thing also is it's not necessarily his first in instinct because if you remember at the end of issue two i think of the family man story arc he he grabs a bread knife and like does practice stabs oh right see i didn't i wasn't taking that seriously i thought he was just sort of like acting out a, an initial thought of like oh he killed my dad so i'm gonna kill him and he just grabbed whatever was near i think it was him practice stabbing like is this gonna work and then he's like nah i need a gun so <laughs> <laughs> i i didn't take that seriously i thought it was him just acting out some sort of inner rage of like oh this you know i'm gonna kill him knife like fake stabbing or whatever i, I thought it was just him just expressing some anger and him. I, I didn't really think he was like, I'm going to use this literal bread knife to like, like find him and like kill him by stabbing him to death. I thought it was him expressing his anger. And then being like, I have to find a way to kill him with a gun. <laughs> so, so I probably misread that. I, I totally was thinking of, of it as more of just like an expression of anger. Yes. Yeah. I think, I think he was, literally serious about using a bread knife which probably wouldn't have worked anyway very well and no, then <laughs> and then he's like oh i'm you know knife work is up close and messy i should just get a gun because that's easier but you know uh i'm sure in england it's not very easy to get a gun he obviously knows people in the underworld so um but yeah i just thought that was interesting that he goes for a gun like you said instead of using spells or something like that um but i guess because it's not a supernatural being he doesn't automatically go to supernatural for the fix, right? Like he, he just sticks with the physical world. And it also creates like an interesting storyline because we get to see him do it with his hands. And that's also why I think another layer of why it's so hard for him to do it is because like you were saying, he's got to get his hands dirty with this. Like with, with Gary Lester, it was, you know, one Gary did it to himself and he was already, you know, going to cause all this other havoc going on in New York. And then two, uh, Papa Midnight was there to help him do it. So it was kind of like, you know, it wasn't his, the, the blood wasn't on his hands necessarily, all the way at least. And then the same with, uh, what's his name? Richie, the, the computer guy. It's like, well, he was in the computer and this happened. And I'm actually just putting him out of his misery. I'm not murdering him. I'm just going to make him go to sleep because his body's already dead. Like, so there's a little bit of separation there as well. And then, but this is like straight, like I have to physically pull a trigger and murder this guy. So I get, I guess I get why it's, he's a little bit more hesitant on that. Uh, I guess morally, but. I guess we're a little harsh on him. Just have, with everything he's been through, we should get, we should cut him some slack a little bit with, with the fact that he does have a moral quandary about this. <laughs> That's true. I just, you know, I'm not used to him having morals, so. Yeah, it's, it's a little weird. It felt out of character, but. As, as we've talked about it, it does it does make sense that he would have hesitation about 
doing it himself and the fact that he has to do it at all. Yeah. Well, and that's also like, this is the early issues of this series, right? So every one of these story arcs is developing a different part of him that you didn't know about. Like, so this is kind of like, okay, we, we can see like where he's coming from on this after we talk about it for a bit. Um, and so it is like establishing these different facets of his personality or moral system that we didn't know before. So it makes sense that we would maybe miss it. But also, like I said, Jamie Delano kind of hides his meanings and stuff sometimes, or like exactly what he's trying to say doesn't always get conveyed perfectly. So maybe that's part of it too. I'm actually surprised he didn't have Chaz do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Chaz could have done it cause he's in the story. So they could have totally done that, but. I love the way they did like sort of work out their plan and that it did work to an extent of like, like throwing him off of like, Oh, so he knows I'm probably staying with Chaz. So Chaz will have me kicked out. I'll go stay with his, you know, cousin, the uh, prostitute. And then, you know, fake him out with when I'm going to get up and get on train, all that, that whole, that whole story of, of the way they set their trap was brilliant. I mean, that was brilliant. (laughs) And that Chaz, you know, my favorite part of that is, is when oh sorry go oh but that Chaz followed the family man back to the hotel and like told john everything that he saw so that you know he would be ready to take him on but still the fact that 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 was the extent of Chaz's, you know i mean Chaz could have hit him with the car right like that could have yeah. been how they killed him like just <laughs> drive him drive over the old man he can't run away from a car so you know he has a box of donuts and he's just you know standing stand in a stoplight and just Bam, <laughs> exactly not paying attention um but yeah the, my favorite part of that little section is the fact that john's like i can't have sex with you you know prostitute friend of of chaz's and then he's like he wakes up he's like actually let's have sex like never mind, let's never mind. Like, <laughs> and then it makes him wake up later than he wanted so like it's like john your life's on the line man think think with your big head not your little one <laughs> But he has needs, and he's so stressed out. He's got to, you know, clear his mind. Apparently, that's that's the best way he can think to do it. <laughs> Literally, to do it. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, so, yeah, once, you know, John kills him, and, you know, the family man's dead. And then issue 31, which is one of my favorite issues of this early, you know, Jamie Delano run, um, is, is the morning. It's called The Morning of the Mag- Magician, and it's about, you know, him putting his dad to rest. And you get to see their, his whole family. So, you know, we've seen Cheryl, his sister, and her husband before, and also his niece, Gemma. But uh, they, she was pretty young. And this whole storyline, this issue, I was like, wow, that's a really, like, creepy way to like, get to know the family is through the ghost of the dad haunting the daughter. And you're like, why is he haunting Gemma? We don't know, you know. But when you find out why... Like, I don't know, it's super hardcore. It made me think, like, okay, so that's where John's morals were when he was a teenager. He's willing to curse his dad with, like, magic that he doesn't quite understand how bad it's going to be. And then when he does, he's like, oh, shit, I got to put you, I got to okay, tie your soul to this dead cat, so I got to put it in formaldehyde so it won't rot and you won't die. It's like, Jesus Christ, like, that's super fucked up. And then the fact that, like, the dad couldn't be in peace and couldn't leave like his soul couldn't because John did that at a very young age. Uh, and like, and then you think John would have taken care of that before because his dad's been in bad health, right? Yeah. The fact that it took his dad dying to remember uh, <laughs> that he had done that was kind of like, uh, you think that'd be something important he would have like, you know, known about before this. <laughs> yeah. It would have been like, Oh yeah, maybe I, like my dad, I can see he's sick whenever I see him or whatever. And maybe he doesn't see him often enough. Maybe that's why. But, um, you know, if he keeps, like, dying or, like, getting sicker and sicker, it's just barely preserving him, right? Like, the formaldehyde on that cat that his soul is tied to is barely preserved in that formaldehyde. I mean, he's still feeling gross and horrible. So you think he'd be like, yeah, I need to, like, tell my dad. Or I need to, like, fix my dad. (laughs) And I'll figure out how to do that. But I think think the issue was... And I mean, maybe later on when he's older now, like he could have figured out a way to break the curse. But the way they made it seem like in the issue was the curse is there until the cat is dead and the, or the cat's body is gone. And once the cat's body is gone, it's tied to his dad like that. So if he tried to like burn it early, it would have just burned his dad's body up. Right. 
Yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. Oh, that's an interesting point. Yeah, so when his dad is dead now, he can burn the cat, and then that will release the soul because the body is officially dead then, right? Like any life force left over. But I like that one a lot. It, like it's very like messed up to see it's like one of the first flashbacks we get of john's like history and then i think it, it actually is the first one i think i can't think of another time before this where you flash back to john as a kid no because before it was just um when when he was what was he, he was in his 20s oh, right? Newcastle, whole, right? Yeah. yeah that was that was still like later early but that was after he was out of his dad's house and one this was like him 15 or something yeah, I think you're right. I think this is the first time we see a snippet of his child or, you know, early teens, mid-teens era life. Yeah, and I, th- I think it's interesting to see him younger and, like, less responsible as, like, a magician who's, like, just getting whatever he can get his hands on magic-wise and, like, just doing it to see what happens. And he's willing to, like, do that to his dad, even if his dad is terrible. Um you know, doing that to someone you know or love is like <laughs> pretty fucked up. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty messed up. I also think that if it had, well, and maybe this is him also potentially having some morals, but if the grandfather hadn't been haunting Gemma, would he have bothered to free his soul? Oh, that's true too. I didn't even think about that. Because the fact that he was haunting Gemma, I think, was the reason he was, oh man, this is actually horrible that i let him you know stay connected to that cat for so long and totally forgot about it but if he had just been a wandering spirit not haunting Gemma or like anybody if he'd just been wandering around would he have remembered or cared <laughs> to release right. him probably not you know that could have been a future storyline maybe where his dad's like i've been here for so long yeah like- <laughs> or if he would have just joined uh you know john's other ghost friends and just also just been hanging around and he might not have remembered. He might have been just like, oh, fuck. Well, he's just like my other friends who are just hanging around and not remembered the cat either. But I think it was specifically the fact that he was, the dad was haunting Gemma is what I think sparked his memory and his his uh, choice to free his dad. <laughs> yeah, and that makes sense because Gemma and, Gemma and his sister Cheryl are the only two people that John really cares about in life. For the most part. I mean, like, I mean, he cares about Chaz, but is very guarded. Like he's he's got like that bro love for Chaz, where he doesn't ever say it, but then at, in little moments he's like, "I love you, man." Like, so so there's there's that. Sorry, I screwed you over and made you like sell your cab because I said the apocalypse was coming. But that, was, yeah. that was my bad. That one's on me. That one <laughs> is on me. But still, but. you were the one who believed me, and you should have known better. <laughs> yeah. So with this last issue, do you think uh, that? It added a lot to the Family Man story arc to have this weird epilogue, you know, death of the grandpa issue. I thought it was actually a nice end cap to it because the ending of, you know, the Family Man arc with him dying, with him sort of being in that place of I literally just murdered somebody. I kind of liked having a little afterthought of him processing everything because he he didn't really get to process his dad's death through the actual fighting of, you know, like fighting, evading the Family Man. So giving us that little after bit that little bit of um you know oh we get to find a little bit more of his childhood he gets to interact with Gemma and his sister again and sort of giving his dad some peace which is probably not something he would have ever thought to do but but still ended up doing i I liked that they added on that little bit of closure because you could have just ended it right yeah they could have just started whatever next story arc right after and be like okay i guess you know his dad died and whatever (laughs) Yeah, but this was a nice way to, like you said, give it an epilogue, give us a yeah. little more. It took time. It was, yeah, it wasn't necessary, but I am really grateful that they they did do that and they chose to do that. Yeah, yeah, I like it as well. I think it's a very good way to like end cap this story, especially because it is such a, an important thing in John's life with his it's his dad being killed. So, you know, they they reference that many many times in the future so it makes sense that they would or it's it's good that they you know uh like hit hit this little end cap with it because it means a lot in the storyline so uh, even if it doesn't necessarily mean as much to john like the, the death of his dad it still has resonance in the rest of the story throughout 
the 300 issues. So, um, I think it was a good, good call. I don't know if you knew that was going to happen, but, <laughs> but it was a good call to like spend time with this little, little last issue. But with issue 31, that is the, the end of our talking about these issues. Uh, and you kind of already said this and I already think I know the answer, but what, what, what would you rate the arcs so far? We have the family man, the fear machine and original sins. What's the order you would rate them as from best to worst? Well, I think this is my new favorite, just having gone through it and the roller coaster that it kind of provides you with like his moral quandary with the introduction of the family man being this like, oh, just an old dude, probably like you would be like, oh, he kind of reminds me of my grandpa or, you know, my elderly neighbor or something. And then you find out he's actually this like, you know, sadistic killer. And you're like, holy shit. Like that already was a twist that I never would have seen coming. And I don't know of anyone who would have seen that coming just because it's, it's not the typical sort of serial killer. Who's always like some young 20 something, like with, you know, a zest for life and like, ah, oh, I can't wait to do some more killing sort of character. But but just that twist of who the antagonist would be and that it was, it was, you know, with the, even with the side note of the, you know, the three issues was still a short arc, which was great. So I think this one is my first favorite. Now original sins is either tied or just below it. Um, Cause it is a little bit shorter. <laughs> yeah. And it's like multiple issues that are like their own single story. Some of them. So, yeah. And it was really cool, but it's also an epic like story because it involves the city and it involves like hundreds of people all being infected by the demon and it, you know it's a much bigger story but this was a much more intimate story that involved just a handful of people and really focused on you know john having to make these choices and and then of course fear machines down there <laughs> <laughs> yeah well we only have one more uh, arc left in jamie delano's run which is issues 32 through 40 so we'll, we'll, we'll hit that. Uh, we'll do a hell talk episode on that once it's over and we'll talk about Jamie Delano as a writer in the last arc and all that. But, um, but yeah. Uh, so is there anything I missed or anything that you wanted to bring up specifically? Actually, I was just thinking about the fact that at the end of the issue, when he has shot the fan man and the fan man's lying, they're dying. And he's like, if you, if you loved me, you would kill me. So it's sort of a weird way to put it. But I, I think that was the gist of what he was saying. And John does like end his life. Would you have done the same thing knowing what this guy has done, knowing that he killed your father, that he would probably go, you tried to kill you. He would go on to kill other people. Would you give him that mercy of killing him quickly or him obviously having a gut shot? It would take a bit for him to die. Would you have, like maybe just walked away and let him suffer? <laughs> I, I would have only because then I would be sure that he was dead. You know, like, mm, like if, if you leave him in a field, maybe he gets away and you, and you have to deal with him later again. You know, I've read, I've watched too many movies where that happens, like Red Dragon or something, you know, where like you think he's dead and then he's not. Don't double tap. huh? Yeah. Exa- yeah. You got to double tap. So, <laughs> um, there's too many movies where that happens. So, yeah, for sure. If if I knew this, I don't consider it a mercy. Either way, you're dead. I don't really care if it takes you that long to get there or not. I just want you out of my life and not have to think about you anymore. So that's if I was John killing the family man, not right in reality. I'm not not in general. Like I'm not asking <laughs> a general question of like, so yeah. you just shot this guy, Matt. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a moral question for you, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> so you murdered someone. <laughs> yeah. In the basis of the story, I don't know. I think I would have wanted to know more about the old man like if obviously he's suffering and dying at this point but i would have still wanted to know like why a few more whys i'd be like hey with your last breaths tell me why like tell me more of the like why were you killing people like why did you kill me i mean obviously he knows why i killed his daddy to get him but still like the why i would have wanted to know a bit more information yeah i feel like the family man wouldn't even like give him that so i mean he could ask but i doubt I doubt he would get that. And then it would just be like, okay, well then I'm going to kill you. So like, to me, there's not even a point because like at some point, some of those serial killers and stuff, most of them are just doing it for compulsion reason, right? Like they have a need or an urge to kill. So I feel like that's what it was with him too. Uh, so maybe there isn't even a why at that point, um, other than genetically I'm fucked up or something. So, so um, but 
Yeah, interesting. It is interesting to think about. Like, he could have gone a certain way with it, and he didn't. Um, I mean, obviously, it would have taken more panels to go through that, and they just needed, like, a, a quick, clean ending for it. But it, in the in the sense of, like, in that moment, you know, I would have wanted to at least ask. Even if he didn't answer, I would have wanted to ask a question of maybe in his last moments he would have wanted to confess or something, or at least uh, say something, you know, what what would his final words be? But, but yeah, I was just curious. That was just my thought. Um, I also wanted to know what your favorite cover was of this particular arc. Oh, my favorite cover is issue 31. Actually, it's a tie. It's issue 31 and issue 27. So 31 is the, the morning of the magician. So the cover of that one is uh, his dad's body that's been all cut up and like his arm is missing from the, the family man murdering him. And it's all creepy and pale looking. And it's like hauntingly standing in front of what looks like a bed or like a crib or something. And so <laughs> it's just really creepy. And I love, I love the way it looks. It's very striking. And then the hold me one, which is uh, the Neil Gaiman issue was issue 27. That one, uh, it's, I don't know. Some, it's also haunting and there's a little, it's just, they both have similar, like creepy factors in them. And I just think those are the ones that stand out the most to me uh, out of this, all out of the ones in this arc. Yeah. That was my favorite too. The no game and Damon King cover as well, because it was so simple, but so striking at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. They, I mean, these early covers, they really, with the vertigo titles, they, they were like, we're going to do something different. We're not going to have like hero poses on the cover, but the way that they do them still is just as, intriguing to me or even more so intriguing because you see you know how many times you see superman on the front flying forward with his fist in the air or whatever it's like okay we get it or punching someone near laser vision or something so it's like yeah we get it they fight but all of these are like way esoteric or just little things from the background of each issue and they put them on the cover and um yeah they do a really good job of still making it intriguing and very artistic so you're like oh this is like weird and like spooky you know <laughs> it's like unsettling i also liked the one for the for the first uh for 23 with the the sort of stories at the bottom and 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 just the makeup of that cover was really cool too because it really like at first you're like what is this gibberish like i don't understand what this has to do but then obviously it leads into it being about fairy tales and fairy tale characters so i like the idea that a lot of times the cover is like what what is this what does this have to do with the story? Then you're like, oh, no, this is actually what the story is. And I guess over time you start to realize, okay, I have to look at the cover and sort of try and see if I can figure out what the story is going to be about because the story is there in the cover. But it still doesn't give away the story necessarily. It just gives Not you kind at of all. a hint of what, yeah, they what, just it, drop little what hints. it might be. Yeah. It just drops little hints of what's in the story. Like I said, they'll have, like in the last issue of the Family Man arc where the – the gun is involved. It's like, okay, there's a gun and then there's like a doll in the background. And then there's like, <laughs> so it's like, Oh, I, you get, once you read the story, like, Oh, I understand what all these references are too on the cover. But before that, you're just kind of like, what the fuck is all this shit? It's like a, a collage. It's just intriguing. And you and you have no idea what any of it actually means until you get to, you know, you actually read the story and you're like, Oh, that was brilliant. The way they just like wove everything together in this weird picture that, that doesn't give anything away, but also gives everything away. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If you've read it, you know, and if you, you haven't, then you don't. So, um, that, and that's kind of an interesting cover. I like the way that Vertigo does their covers like that. And Sandman has a lot of covers like that too, because Dave McKean did all those covers and it's very interesting. I love those. But, don't ask me what my favorite is of those. Cause I can't. <laughs> <laughs> all of them. <laughs> They're all 10. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Is there anything else uh, you want to talk about? Actually, it was something I've been thinking about for a while, but I keep forgetting to ask since I've had the opportunity to ask you until, uh, so now I'm finally going to ask it. But so I know when you started the main podcast, it was mostly just kind of focusing on almost anything that you guys were interested in. But then you decided to do these individual, uh, you know, specific minis of, you know, first Swamp Thing and then, and then Hellblazer, like what what made you decide to, to branch off that way? I mean, you could have just kept doing, you know, the regular podcast and and talking about just individual trades or or you know, first uh first trades or, or, or random stories. But but why specifically did you go off on these sort of like 
extremely long tangents, I guess. You could say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could say that. <laughs> um, well, so I think it just started because I wanted to read every issue of Swamp Thing and Hellblazer, and I've read a lot of Hellblazer. So I think out of the whole run of 300 issues, I've there's only two two runs of it, maybe like 50 issues total that I haven't read. So I've read a majority of Hellblazer, but I do know that it's kind of daunting because it's 300 issues. And I thought, okay, like if I do this and I record it, then people can hear it and you know, more people will get into Hellblazer. And that's kind of what I want. I want this character to be, I love this character and I want to share that love with everybody. And then the Swamp Thing one's the same thing, except I hadn't read most of that. So <laughs> I think I'd only read the Neil Gaiman run. I'm not sorry, uh, the, the Alan Moore run of Swamp Thing. And so I was like, well, I want to read it and I might as well just read it with everybody and see how it goes. So um, I did Swamp Thing first because I was listening to uh, Kevin Smith has a podcast called Fat Man on Batman, or it was it was called <laughs> Fat Man on Batman. Nice. And uh, yeah. And one of the early, like, I think it's like issue or episode 40 or 50, he just decided one time, because normally he would like interview people. And so it was just him interviewing people that had to do with Batman, like people from the animated series or whatever. And I guess he like didn't have someone to interview one week. So he's like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to read a, an episode or an issue of Swamp Thing that I love that has Batman in it. And he read it like me talking to you, like describing every panel and what's going on in it. So I loved that. I thought it was awesome, but it was Kevin Smith doing it. So it was like four hours long. <laughs> so, you know, cause he goes on tangents or whatever. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I loved that he did that. And then also it reminded me of a podcast and this is crazy. Cause I, I kind of can't believe podcasts are this old, but uh, I used to listen to a podcast in 2008 called, um, called Tom versus the flash. I think it's called Tom versus comics now. And it's not, he doesn't make them anymore, but he still has it up so you can listen to it if you want. But basically this, this guy named Tom went back uh, and was, he originally he was doing a blog for every issue of, I think it was Justice League at first and then it was The Flash. So he then turned it into a podcast and like starting from some issue of The Flash I think it's like Flash 120 or something. He started from there with the podcast and was like, all right. And then he just like talked about each issue, talked about, you know, the funny stuff, what happens in it. And it was like little 10 minute episodes. And I loved it. I was like, oh, this is great. I get to learn Flash history and I don't have to track down these old issues. And so from those two things, I was like, oh, yeah, I want to do that. But for characters I like. So so instead of doing the Flash or Superman or whatever, I was like, OK, I'm going to do Swamp Thing first. And then that was going well. And I was enjoying that. Um, so then I was like, well, I'm going to do Hellblazer, especially since in Swamp Thing, like they tie in when Hellblazer gets his own series. So I could do like, uh, you know, actually in tandem reading and see where they connect. Kind of like if, like with Buffy and Angel, if you yeah, watch yeah. Buffy the Vampire Slayer and then you could j watch Angel, Angel and you can, you know, interweave them <laughs> as they yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. They can go uh, back and, that and kind forth of, and they actually match up if you watch them right. Yeah, it kind of gives it like an interesting story you know, together, um, and see where they, they, uh, match up, like you said. So that I was like, Oh, since I'm coming on that issue, I might as well start the hellblazer podcast when that happens. So I did that. Um, and yeah, I just think, uh, it was just like a fun thing. I want, I just want to share, share these characters with people. And a lot of people don't have time to read or find comics and especially people who maybe watch the movie and don't really have an interest in getting into the hobby of comics which is a whole thing, right? You got to collect, you got to know where to look for them and you know, it's expensive. And then, so if you could just go on Spotify and be like, I want to learn a little bit about Hellblazer or Constantine and you find my podcast, then we can go through the whole storyline of all, all 300 issues and you can listen to it in your car when you're driving or, you know, whatnot. And so he could become your favorite comic book character, even without you having to read the comics necessarily. Now, I love comics and I would love it if people would be like, well, now I got to buy this stuff because it's so awesome. But, you know, I'm realistic. Most people <laughs> don't have time to sit down like I do. Uh, actually, I don't have time either, but I still force myself to read all this stuff. And, um, and you know, because I enjoy it so much and I want to like share that with everybody. So that's kind of why I got into doing this. And that's how I came up with the like, I'm going to gonna read specific characters. But yeah, that's uh, is there anything else? That's so cool. If you hadn't, um, well, if 
if say the stories hadn't aligned the way they did with Swamp Thing and Hellblazer, would you have done them simultaneously the way you're doing them now if they didn't have no, that connection? For sure not. For sure not. <laughs> it's a lot of work to do both. They um and they don't like they don't click you know together enough to really ma- make it matter either. <laughs> so like at the beginning there was a lot more uh, weaving of of the characters and now uh, there's not so much. They kind of went their separate ways a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but it is fun seeing um seeing them like at the it's it's fun reading them when they were coming out in real time. So you can see like in the 90s they have this same feel. And that kind of makes them like you can see how they were together, even if they're not tied in together. You get like, oh, they're still talking about the same issues that both are talking about in the 90s. The throwbacks or the mentions. <laughs> yeah, so you get all those those uh, little Easter eggs, we'll call them. So it's still fun to read them together. But doing the podcast and then the main podcast I do, too, is, it's a lot of work. But it is fun. And I love going through it like with you meeting you and having you be able to talk to you about you know hellblazer is like the thing i wanted right like i want to talk about these characters with people that didn't know about them before um so you're like my success story it's been so great because (laughs) i've loved all like you said the easter eggs that have popped up in swamp thing and hellblazer like the tiniest mention of the serial convention which was in Sandman and that the family man was invited, which I, it's been a while since I read it, but I think they mentioned his name in that actual issue where they're like, oh, you know, the family guy didn't, or sorry, family man didn't show up. And, you know, it's a completely throwaway line, like it is in here where they just mention, oh, you've been invited to attend the, you know, first uh, serial killers convention, which I loved in Sandman. They spelt it serial as in like breakfast cereal, just, just to cover their tracks, which I thought was, was perfect. But just a little tidbit like that, I was like, oh my gosh, they're talking about the convention that was in Sandman. That's so cool. Because, of course, he's a serial killer. He would be invited. And so, like, little things like that, which I would never have known about any of these connections. Um, I, I, I'm in love with the fact that they're all connected. Someday, I will probably get all the, not the issues of Hellblazer. I'm not an issue collector, but I would love the trades. Yes, yeah, someday when I have the room. <laughs> the new trades that they printed are, are actually have every issue, I believe, in them. So, like, uh, they collect, like, everything, which is very cool. Some of them are out of print now, but I'm sure they'll put them back in print um, at some point in time. So, Yeah, I would love to get the trades someday. <laughs> I'm really glad that you dig Hellblazer just from, from the podcast. So, Oh, yeah. No, I, I'm so glad that you – well, that's why I was curious because if you would, had just never decided to, you know, do these – specific podcast Swamp Thing and Hellblazer. I wouldn't have known anything about these characters beyond what I did know because I would have never thought to research it on my own. So the fact that you took the time to go through all of these characters and are take, continually taking the time to go through everything is amazing because I'm probably not going to get the Swamp Thing issue just because it's, it's a little daunting with how many there are. Yeah, there's a lot. But Hellblazer, I think, is is attainable. So I I will probably go that direction uh, someday, just so I can have, you know, that next to my Sandman collection. The nice thing about Hellblazer, I'll say this, if you wanted to get the issues, there are no, at least of right now, there's no, like, first appearance of anybody in them because Swamp or uh, John's first appearance is in Swamp Thing. Right. So the first issue of Hellblazer isn't really worth that much or it's not priced up that much, right? So... Like if you wanted to get it, you could probably find a copy for like ten bucks on eBay. <laughs> but I'd say the the hardest one to find is that that Neil Gaiman one. <laughs> so, um, and that, it's not hard to find; it's just more expensive. Yeah, that I, that for that alone, I would probably get the trade just so I have it collected with all those together. If I were to get individual issues, they probably would be those ones that have connections to either Neil Gaiman or characters like like Matthew the Raven or something like that. Cause there are some of those in Swamp Thing and those would probably be the only issues I personally would nab just to sort of add to my Sandman collection. But overall I, I do, I am in love with the series and the way you're going through it. I do appreciate the time and effort that you're putting into this. And I really hope that more people, you know, will search or, or who are just curious will find uh, these come across them, whatever issue we happen to be on. And then be like, oh, this is really interesting. 
let me go back and see because I don't have to go out and buy it. I can sit down and listen to it whenever. I personally like to listen when I'm like doing chores, dishes or whatever, because it helps pass the time. <laughs> yeah. I usually listen to podcasts when I drive and stuff. So that's, I think a lot of people do that. Um, so yeah, well, I'm glad, I'm glad it's meant a lot to you. I enjoy doing it. Like I said, it is a lot of time, but it's fun time. Like it's, it's fun being able to share these characters with people and get people who wouldn't necessarily read them on their own or check those books out. People are a lot more willing to listen to something while they're passively or passively listen while they're doing something active, like working or driving than they are to like sit down and read. And how many people actually read anymore anyway, like re regular books. And then, well, I do, but I'm weird. So. Well, yeah, yeah, we're weird. Though, so. Um, but yeah, like, you know, most people don't sit down to read books and if they do, they're not comic books usually. Usually. Uh, yeah. So, and then, and then with that, they're probably more care, more uh, popular characters like Superman or Batman or whatever. They're not automatically going to be like, oh yeah, Swamp Thing, I'll check this out, or Hellblazer, what is this? Because it says Hellblazer too. It's not even John Constantine, which they might know the name Constantine from the movie. It's Hellblazer, so they might not even know that that's the same character. So <laughs> that's why in the title of this podcast I put John Constantine, a Hellblazer podcast, oh, Hellblazer. <laughs> so that if you search for either <laughs> of those things, it works. But. It's there. Yeah, it's there. Everybody, you got to check these out. You got to, you know, start from the beginning. And if you catch up to where we are now and want to know what happens next, like Matt said, he's way ahead in the Patreon. You got to come join us there. Oh, yeah. the here. thank you for the plug so you can catch up <laughs> yeah so if you want this stuff to... gets crazy <laughs> yes yeah it only gets better from here i think you know i mean jamie delano's run is no uh slouch like i think it's a, a pretty solid run of comics but when garth ennis takes over at issue 41 it only gets better and then uh, in my opinion at least and then you know if you would like to i think we're on, we're on, almost through garth ennis's run right now we're on issue 74 as of this week so um if you would like to join our patreon to get access to all those episodes uh you can go to patreon.com slash planes trains and comic books all one word and uh with that i think unless there's anything else we'll see you on the next one see you guys later bye